All right, we're back in another Sound the Battle Cry. And today we're going to be doing something a little bit different. We're going to be starting uh, to talk about some history. And the history that we're going to talk about is the history of the Jesuits. This order called the Society of Jesus, falsely so called. And uh, the reason that this is important, that we need to talk about this, is for uh, many reasons. Um, so first of all, you can't even understand history or church history for the past 500 years if you don't understand the Jesuits. Uh, it's just, you just can't understand it. There's so many things that have happened. There's so many things that they're connected to. Uh, they've been thrown out of 83 countries. And um, there's a lot of people throughout history that have written about them. A lot of not only Protestant leaders, but also political leaders, even uh, John Adams and other people that have talked about them. And also, it still applies to modern day times. There are many people that are educated, that have been trained and educated by the Jesuits that you know about today, such as Dr. Fauci. He, has, he was educated by the Jesuits the whole beginning of his life, and they had the biggest impact on his thinking of any other uh, group of people in his life. And so, uh, and also, in addition to that, the, um, this issue is connected to some other issues, like the Bible version issue. It's also connected to a bigger issue, which I'm going to be talking about more, which is Revelation 17. Revelation chapter 17, the mother of harlots and abominations of the earth, which I believe is the Catholic Church. It's a religious power. The harlot riding the beast. And if you go back and watch my video, um, The Little Horn Power Revealed, I talk about the Vatican, the Catholic Church being the Little Horn Power. And that because the, the Little Horn Power has to. 100% has to come out of Rome, the fourth kingdom. That is very clear from Scripture. I outline, outline the whole thing from Bible prophecy, uh, from the book of Daniel and everything, and uh, also from history, and it's all laid out there. So there's a lot of different reasons we should talk about this stuff. It, it impacts many your understanding of many different subjects. And so <clears throat> you don't want to be ignorant you do not want to be ignorant of this history and you don't want to be ignorant of Satan's devices as well. And um, so before we move on and start this, uh, because what we're going to start with today, uh, it's going to be multi-parts, right? And the first part today is going to be the origin story of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits. And uh, before we get into that, I'm going to read a verse because this is applicable to the Jesuits. Um, so the Jesuits are known for being um, people that disguise themselves. They infiltrate, they blend in in different areas of society. They can basically, they're known for being able to pretend to be anyone, anywhere. And there is a perfect passage that describes them and what they do in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13, which says this, For such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And no marvel, for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness, whose end shall be according to their works. Okay, so when it says his ministers, it's talking about Satan's ministers. Satan has his ministers, deceitful workers, transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ. And that's what the Jesuits have done and they continue to do uh, to this day. And so um, we're going to get into it now um, because... Man, there's a lot to talk about, a lot of ground to cover. I hope this is uh, you get a lot out of this, because, um, like I said, trust me, we're gonna use this, be able to draw from this knowledge base in the future. I'll be able to say, hey, go back and listen to those teachings if you haven't already, so that you can understand things I'll be talking about in the future. 
And also another thing is too, there's sometimes, you know, there's sometimes an issue where some of the, sometimes this information is covered by other people, but it, it's tainted because they have some uh, other bad views or disinformation that's tied together with it. Uh, some t sometimes they're even ra overtly racist. And I know that term's thrown around a lot today, and it basically means nothing, but I mean actually 100% really racist. And so, you know, we don't want anything associated with that stuff. So we just want to cover the information. So let's get into this. So what we're going to be reading from is a book called The History of Protestantism by J.A. Wiley. He is a very good historian, and he tells the story of Ignatius Loyola and the Jesuits. So we're going to start with that today. All right, so we're here at this section called Book 15, The Jesuits, Chapter 1, Ignatius Loyola. And, um, you know, I'm going to be reading from this book, but, you know, I will in interject commentary and some Bible verses and, and these types of things. So uh, let's get into it. Protestantism has marshaled its spiritual forces a second time and placing itself at the heart of Christendom at a point where three great empires met. It was laboring with redoubled vigor to propagate itself on all sides. It was expelling from the air of the world that ancient superstition, horn of paganism and Judaism, which like an opaque veil had darkened the human mind. A new light was breaking on the eyes and a new life stirring in the souls of men. Schools of learning, pure churches and free nations were springing up in different parts of Europe, while hundreds of thousands of disciples were ready by their holy lives or heroic deaths to serve that great cause, which having broken their ancient fetters had made them the heirs of a new liberty and the citizens of a new world. It was clear that if let alone for only a few years, Protestantism would achieve a victory so complete that it would be vain for any opposing power to think of renewing the contest. If that power, which was seated in Geneva, was to be withstood, and the tide of victory was, which was bearing it to dominion rolled back, there must no longer delay in the measures necessary for achieving such a result. Okay, so at this time, um, you know, this was the height of the explosion of Protestantism. And the Protestant Reformation uh, was not only a spiritual movement um, that championed doctrines like justification by faith, sola scriptura, and these types of things, it was also impacting the world politically. It was changing kingdoms, countries, the leadership of various places, and it was starting to undermine and break the power of the Catholic Church that they had in the world. And that's one of the biggest reasons that the you know there was a necessity in the eyes of the Catholic Church for the order of the Jesuits because there they were starting to lose their grip on the world especially on Europe and so they needed there was the Protestant Reformation right they needed a counter reformation and that's what the order of the Jesuits were a counter reformation all right let's continue it was further clear that armies would never affect the overthrow of Protestantism. The serried strength of Popish Europe had been put forth to crush it, but all in vain. Protestantism had risen only the stronger from the blows which it was hoped would overwhelm it. It was plain that other, weapon must, other weapons must be forged and other arms mustered than those which Charles and Francis had been accustomed to lead into the field. It was now that the Jesuit corps was embodied. And it must be confessed that these new soldiers did more than all the armies of France and Spain to stem the tide of Protestant success and bind victory once more to the banners of Rome. Okay, so they're saying they needed more than just the raw military persecuting power that they've had in the past. Now, no, no doubt about it, they would continue to kill and to torture and to try to stamp out physically Protestants, but they also saw a need for, uh, you know, religious doctrines, for a spiritual approach 
uh, and a counter t- a strategy against Protestantism. They couldn't just stamp them out um, militarily. We have seen Protestantism renew its energies. Rome, too, will show what she is capable of doing. As the tribes of Israel were approaching the frontier of the Promised Land, a wizard prophet was summoned from the east to bar their entrance by his div- divinations and enchantments. As the armies of Protestantism neared their final victory, there started up the Jesuit host, with a subtler casuistry and a darker divination than Balaam's, to dispute with the Reformed the possession of Christendom. We shall consider that host in its rise, its equipments, its discipline, its diffusion, and its successes. Okay, so now we're going to get into Ignatius Loyola and uh, see his origin story and how it all started. Don Inigo Lopez de Ricald, the Ignatius Loyola of history, that was his real name, Um, his real name, Don Inigo Lopez de Ricald, was the founder of the Order of Jesus or the Jesuits. His birth was nearly contemporaneous with that of Luther. He was the youngest son of one of the highest Spanish grandees and was born in his father's castle of Loyola in the province of uh, Guipuzcoa in 1491. His youth was passed at the splendid and luxurious comfort of Ferdinand the Catholic. Spain at the time was fighting to expel the Moors whose presence on her soil she counted at once an insult to her independence and an affront to her faith. She was ending the conflict in Spain, but continuing it in Africa. The naturally ardent soul of Ignatius was set on fire by the religious fervor around him. He grew weary of the gaieties and frivolities of the court, nor could even the dalliances and adventures of knight errantry satisfy him. He thirsted to earn renown on the field of arms. Embarking in the war, which at that time engaged the religious enthusiasm and military chivalry of his countrymen, he soon distinguished himself by his feats of daring. Ignatius was bidding fair to take a high place among warriors and transmit to posterity a name encompassed with the halo of military glory, but with that halo only. At this stage of his career, an incident befell him which cut short his exploits on the battlefield and transferred his enthusiasm and chivalry to another sphere. Okay, so he got all pumped up, wanted to go prove himself on the battlefield, and uh, he got involved with some fighting. But then uh, there was an incident that happened which changed his life and really set him on the course that would change history. It was the year 1521. Luther was uttering his famous no before the emperor and his princes and summoning as with trumpet peal Christendom to arms. It is at this moment the young Ignatius, the intrepid soldier of Spain, about to become yet more intrepid soldier of Rome, appears before it. He is shut up in the town of Pamplona with the French which the French are besieging. The garrison are hard-pressed, and after some whispered consultations, they openly propose to surrender. Ignatius deems the very thought of such a thing dishonor. He denounces the proposed act of his comrades as cowardice, and re-entering the citadel with a few companions as courageous as himself, swears to defend it to the last drop of his blood. By and by, famine leaves him no alternative save to die within the walls, or to cut his way, sword in hand, through the host of the besiegers. He goes forth and joins battle with the French. As he is fighting, desperately he is struck by a musket ball. Wounded dangerously in both legs, and laid senseless on the field, Ignatius had ended the last campaign he was ever to fight with the sword. His valor he was yet to display on other fields but he would mingle no more on those which resound with the clash of arms and the roar of artillery. Okay, so he was injured. He got struck in the legs by a musket ball. He, uh, Ignatius Loyola got hurt very badly. He was taken out and he could no longer fight on the battlefield. And this is where you're going to see 
a lot of things change um, because it drove him to some very uh, strange and desperate practices. So let's take a look at what happens. The bravery of the fallen warrior had won the respect of the foe, raising him from the ground where he was fast bleeding to death. They carried him to the hospital of Pamplona and tended him with care till he was able to be conveyed in a litter to his father's castle. Thrice had he to undergo the agony of having his wounds opened. Imagine back then how painful that would have been, you know, without uh, morphine and all, all the modern day uh, anesthetics that we have and these types of things. Clenching his teeth and closing his fists, he bade defiance to pain. Not a groan escaped him while under the torture of the surgeon's knife. <clears throat> but the tardy passage of the weeks and months during which he waited, the slow healing of his wounds inflicted on his ardent spirit a keener pain than had the um, probing knife on his quivering limbs. Fettered to his couch, he chafed at the inactivity to which he was doomed. Romances of chivalry and tales of war were brought him to beguile the hours. These exhausted other books were produced, but of a somewhat different character. This time it was the legends of the saints that were brought the bedrid night. The tragedy of the early Christian martyrs passed before him as he read. Next came the monks and hermits of the Thebaic deserts and the Sinaitic mountains. With an imagination on fire, he perused the story of the hunger and cold they had braved on the self-conquest. They had achieved of the battles they had waged with evil spirits, of the glorious visions that had been vouchsafed them, and the brilliant rewards they had gained in the lasting reverence of earth and the felicities and dignities of heaven. He panted to rival these heroes, whose glory was of a kind so bright and pure that compared with it the renown of the battlefield was dim and sordid. His enthusiasm and ambition were as boundless as ever, but now they were directed into a new channel. Henceforward, the current of his life was changed. Okay, so while he's sitting there recovering from his injuries, he starts reading a lot. He reads about these old supposed saints. You know, a lot of these come from the Catholic Church, lives of monks and these types of things. He reads Catholic writings, right, about these saints. And, of course, they have all these fanciful stories. A lot of times were lies and, and stories about, um, you know, miracles and all these other types of things that happen. And he's reading and reading and reading so much about all these things that this is where all of his attention is focused and this is where... Um, he wants to direct the energies of his life and the direction that he wants to go in. Okay? So, this is where uh, his path changes. He had lain down a knight of the burning sword to use the words of his biographer. Vieira, he rose up from it a saint of the burning torch. The change was a sudden and violent one and drew after it vast consequences not to Ignatius only and the men of his own age, but to millions of the human race in all countries of the world and in all the ages that have elapsed since. He who lay down on his bed the fiery soldier of the emperor rose from it, the yet more fiery soldier of the Pope. Fiery soldier of the Pope. The weakness occasioned by loss of blood the morbidity produced by long seclusion, the irritation of acute and protracted suffering, joined to a temperament highly excitable and a mind that had fed on miracles and visions till its enthusiasm had grown into fanaticism, accounts in part for the transformation which Ignatius had undergone. Though the balance of his intellect was now sadly disturbed, his shrewdness, his tenacity, and his daring remained. Set free from the fetters of calm reason, these qualities had freer scope than ever. The wing of his earthly ambition was broken, but he could take his flight heavenward. If earth was forbidden him, the celestial domain stood open, and there worthier exploits and more brilliant rewards awaited his prowess. Okay, so this guy was on fire now. He was ready to do something. 
Uh, he wanted to follow in the footsteps of all these saints and monks and these types of things. He wanted to serve the Catholic Church, to serve the Pope. And he didn't exactly have the clear-cut plan yet, but he knew he was, uh, he was, he was, you know, he had a fanatic zeal that was ready to do something uh, when it was time to leave that bed. The heart of a soldier plucked out and that of a monk given him, Ignatius vowed before leaving his sick chamber to be the slave, the champion, the knight errant of Mary. That's right. That's who they serve. Uh, the Virgin Mary. We know the Catholic Church exalts Mary way above what is due uh, beyond respect to her. It is to the point of what they call veneration, which is really just worship. They say, no, we don't worship, we venerate. Well, whatever, it's the same thing. You try to say it's not, but, you know, you bow down and you pray to her. What do you think? But anyways, that's who he was ready to serve, Mary. She was the lady of his soul. And after the manner of dutiful knights, he immediately repaired to her shrine at Montserrat, hung up his arms before her image, and spent the night in watching them. But reflecting that he was a soldier of Christ, that great monarch who had gone forth to subjugate all the earth, he resolved to eat no other food, wear no other raiment than his king had done, and endure the same hardships and vigils. Laying aside his plume, his coat of mail, his shield and sword, he donned the cloak of the mendicant. Wrapped in sordid rags, says Duller, an iron chain and prickly girdle pressing on his naked body, covered with filth and with uncombed hair and untrimmed nails. He retired to a dark mountain in the vicinity of Manresa, where was a gloomy cave in which he made his abode for some time. There he subjected himself to all the penances and mortifications of the early anchorites whose holiness he emulated. He wrestled with the evil spirit, talked to voices audible to no ear but his own, fasted for days on end till his weakness was such that he fell into a swoon and one day was found at the entrance of his cave lying on the ground half dead. Okay, so this is where it starts to get pretty crazy, right? He, first of all, it punishes himself. You see this theme, uh, you know, We've heard about this in modern day times with orders such as Opus Dei, where, you know, they will punish themselves to do self-flagellation, whip themselves, um, tie spiked girdles and, and chains around their bodies to um, stab themselves and all kinds of crazy stuff to inflict pain. And this is from a false idea that they need to suffer and punish themselves for their own sins um, instead of trusting that Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sins. And this is one of the great errors of the Catholic Church is that, you know, the Bible says, for by one offering he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. One offering, that's it. You know, Jesus died he took the punishment for our sins. At one time on the cross, he said, it is finished. But they act like, no, that's not enough. It's not finished. We still have to suffer for our sins. Okay, so it's not enough that Jesus Christ took the punishment for our sins. It's not enough that he did, took all that suffering. We still need to add to that. And so that's what happens a lot of times in the Catholic Church. But that's what happened here with Ignatius Loyola. He was punishing himself. He was dirty. He was fasting to the point of really hallucinations. And that's where he had a lot of uh, visions. You're going to hear about this. He, had, uh, he said, uh, talk to voices. Audible to no ear but his own. He started hearing voices. Okay, so he's starving himself. Not regular fasting but beyond the point of being healthy to where now he's hearing voices, okay? 
And I hate to break it to you, but these aren't good voices. Okay? So when this is happening and, and Ignatius Loyola is seeing things and hearing voices, these are spirits. And these spirits are not good. Okay? And these spirits are going to be guiding him. They were guiding him from that point, and they guided him for the rest of his life. And these spirits were not good, to say the least. Now, so he's punishing himself, starving himself, he's filthy, and he's lying on the ground at the entrance of the cave, half dead. I mean, he really pushed himself to the breaking point. It's demonic. It's totally demonic. But let's continue. The cave at Manresa recalls vividly to our memory the cell at Erfurt. The same austerities, vigils, mortifications, and mental efforts and agonies which were undergone by Ignatius Loyola had but a very few years before this been passed through by Martin Luther. Okay, so let's have a brief comment about that. Uh, you know, Martin Luther did some definitely did some good things. Um, you know, he spoke out against the Catholic Church. He criticized their a lot of their doctrines, preached justification by faith, uh, a lot of different things he did that were good. Trans some translation work. But I, you know, I'm not a person who defends, you know, everything from Martin Luther. He had a lot of problems as well. So when we're reading about this history, we're not going to whitewash this and act like Martin Luther was great. You know, there were, I think, a lot more um, Protestant leaders who are, are better examples for us to look to and read about, uh, like William Tyndale, uh, a lot of other guys. Uh, Martin Luther, I don't think, was the greatest example for us to look to. But nevertheless... Uh, we're just going through this history and let's keep the focus on Ignatius Loyola. So far, the career of the founder of the Jesuits and that of the champion of Protestantism were the same. Both had set before them a high standard of holiness. Both had all but sacrificed life to reach it. And I think that's a... I, I don't think that that's a good way to frame that and to word that. Uh, J.A. Wiley putting that a standard of holiness. That's not holiness. Okay. That's, um, you know, it's, it's a show of the flesh. Touch not, touch not, taste not, handle not, like the Bible says. It's um, it punishing yourself, these types of things. That's false holiness. That's not real holiness. But anyways. But at the point to which we have come over the course... I'm sorry. But at the point to which we have come, the courses of the two men widely diverge. Both hitherto in their pursuit of truth and holiness had traveled by the same road. But now we see Luther turning to the Bible, the light that shineth in a dark place, the sure word of prophecy. Ignatius Loyola, on the other hand, surrenders himself to visions and revelations. Okay, and that's, that is a very important distinction here. Okay, the reason that Ignatius Loyola went off into all the crazy things that he, you know, believed and pushed and eventually trained other people to believe is because of these visions and revelations. And when you trust in that and you trust in, you know, feelings and, and visions and these types of things, instead of the word of God, you're going to be deceived. You're going to be led astray. You know, and as it was, he just referenced the sure word of prophecy. The Bible says we have a more sure word of prophecy. And in that passage, it's actually referring to how they heard the voice of God from heaven and that the word of the written word of God is even more sure, more reliable than even hearing a voice from heaven. Okay? This is the word of God is the only way that you can test truth. It's the objective standard for truth and morality. And anytime you have something, if there's a vision, you hear voices, see things, hear things, whatever it may be, and these voices tell you things, how do you know 
that they're true or not unless you compare it to the Word of God. You have no idea. And so what you're doing is you're just blindly trusting voices and visions and assuming that it's from God. You know, oh, this is this is a vision of Christ. This is a vision of Mary. This is an angel. This is that. This is the other thing. You just automatically assume that those are what they portray themselves to be and that you can trust them no matter what. And that's completely false. You're completely, like Ignatius Loyola, is completely discounting that these could be familiar spirits, could be devils, deceiving you, pretending to be an angel, the Virgin Mary, or even Christ. Remember what we read earlier in that passage? And no marvel, for even Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. The Bible specifically says that that's what Satan does. He appears as an angel of light to deceive you. And this is what was happening with Loyola, with the visions and revelations. As Luther went on onward to, I'm sorry, onward, the light grew only the brighter around him. He had turned his face to the sun. Ignatius had turned his gaze inward upon his own beclouded mind and verified the saying of the wise man, he who wandereth out of the way of understanding shall remain in the congregation of the dead. And that's what happened to Ignatius Loyola. All right, so it gets pretty crazy, and uh, we're going to read l more about what he uh, did. Ignatius Loyola. Pretty crazy. Finding him half examined at the mouth of his cave, sympathizing friends carried Ignatius to the town of Manresa, continuing there the same course of penances and self-mortifications which he had pursued in solitude, his bodily weakness greatly increased. But he was more than recompensed by the greater frequency of those heavenly visions with which he now began to be favored. In Manresa, he occupied a cell in the Dominican convent, and as he was then projecting a pilgrimage to Jerusalem, he began to qualify himself for this holy journey by a course of the severest penances. He scourged himself thrice a day, says Ranke. He rose up to prayer at midnight and passed seven hours of each day on his knees. Okay, so this guy was absolutely punishing himself. He did it over and over and over again. He punished himself. He hurt himself. And you don't do that to yourself if you know and you have peace that you have been forgiven of your sins through the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. He had not been forgiven. He wasn't then and he never was in his entire life. And this is why he continued to feel that he needed to punish himself. Now, remember when I said that, you know, this issue would tie together with a lot of other issues? Well, let me just give you one example real quick, since we're talking about Ignatius Loyola punishing himself. Uh, this affects, you know, ties together with modern Bible versions, okay? The Bible version issue. Let me just give you one example of how, you know, there are changes in modern versions from the, you know, the King James Bible... If you compare the King James Bible to all the other versions, there's a lot of differences. Some people say there aren't, you know, very big differences. There are big differences. There are doctrinal differences. But one of the differences I want to talk about right now uh, shows that the modern versions actually in some passages make changes that make the passages more fit Catholic theology. That's correct. Yes, Catholic theology. Let me give you an example. This perfectly fits with Ignatius Loyola, what he's doing. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 27 in the King James Bible says, but I, keep my, but I keep under my body and bring it into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Okay? So he says, I keep under my body, bring it into subjection. Okay? Now... There's that verse. Now the same verse 
in the NIV, New International Version of the Bible, in 1 Corinthians 9.27, the NIV says, No, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. Okay, that's a big difference between keeping my body under, bringing it to subjection, right? It, yes, we should keep the flesh in subjection, right? Read the word of God, pray, don't let, you know, you don't feed the flesh. But it's a whole nother story to say, I strike a blow to my body and make it my slave. And I believe other versions say, I beat my body and make it my slave. Guess what? That is teaching exactly what Ignatius Loyola was doing. Now, why would these modern versions be promoting a practice that Ignatius Loyola practiced? You have to ask yourself that question. Where did that influence come from? But let's continue. It will hardly do to say that this marvelous case is merely an instance of an unstrung bodily condition and of vicious mental stimulants abundantly supplied, where the thirst for adventure and distinction was still unquenched. A closer study of the case will show that there was in it an awakening of the conscience. There was a sense of sin its awful demerit, its fearful award. Loyola, too, would seem to have felt the terrors of death, the pains of hell. He had spent three days in Montserrat in confessing the sins of all his past life, but on a more searching review of his life, finding that he had omitted many sins, he renewed and amplified his confession at Manresa. Okay, because it's never enough. It's never enough. He has to talk about more, more sin and more sin and more sin. If he found peace, it was only for a short while. Again, his sense of sin would return. And to such a pitch did his anguish rise that thoughts of self-destruction came into his mind. Thoughts of suicide. Approaching the window of his cell, he was about to throw himself from it when it suddenly flashed upon him that the act was abhorrent to the Almighty and he withdrew, crying out, Lord, I will not do that aught that I that may offend thee. Okay, so Ignatius Loyola was so depressed about, you know, how he's punishing himself for his sin over and over and over again, and it's never enough, he was about to kill himself, about to jump out a window. Because he had, had nothing to do with salvation. He knows nothing of salvation, had not looked to the scriptures but instead was looking to himself and visions. And where did that lead him? To a very dark and bad place. It did not help him. Okay? And, you know, remember the Bible says, Isaiah 57, 21, There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. There is no peace, saith my God, to the wicked. Ignatius Loyola never, ever had peace. Let's continue. One day he awakened as from a dream. Now I know, said he to himself, that all these torments are from the assaults of Satan. I am tossed between the promptings of the good spirit who would have me be at peace and the dark suggestions of the evil one who seeks continually to terrify me. I will have done with this warfare. I will forget my past life. I will open these wounds not again. Luther, in the midst of tempests as terrible, had come to a similar resolution. Awakening as from a frightful dream, he lifted up his eyes and saw one who had borne his sins upon his cross. And like the mariner who clings amid the surging billows to the rock, Luther was at peace because he had anchored his soul on an almighty foundation. But says Ranke, speaking of Loyola and the course he had now resolved to pursue, this was not so much the restoration of his peace as a resolution. It was an engagement entered into by the will rather than a conviction to which the submission of the will is an inevitable. It required no aid from Scripture. 
It was based on the belief he entertained of an immediate connection between himself and the world of spirits. This would never have satisfied Luther. No inspirations, no visions would Luther admit. All were, in his opinion, alike injurious. He would have the simple, written, indubitable word of God alone. Okay, so, again, Ignatius Loyola is not turning to scripture. He's turning to visions, and he's resolving that, you know, things are going to change. But it's, uh, again, he's going in the wrong direction. Let's continue. We're actually almost at the end of the chapter. From the hour that Ignatius resolved to think no more of his sins, his spiritual horizon began, as he believed to clear up. All his gloomy terrors receded with the past, which he had consigned to oblivion. His bitter tears were dried up, and his heavy sighs no longer resounded through the convent halls. He was taken, he felt, into more intimate communion with God. The heavens were opened that he might have a clear insight into divine mysteries. True, the Spirit had revealed these things in the morning of the world through chosen and accredited channels and inscribed them on the page of inspiration that all might learn from them that infallible source. But Ignatius did not search for these mysteries in the Bible. He did not turn to the Bible. Favored above the sons of men, he received them, as he thought, in revelations made specially to himself. Alas, his hour had come and passed, and the gate that would have ushered him in amid celestial realities and joys was shut. And henceforward, he must dwell amid fantasies and dreams. It was intimated to him one day that he should yet see the Savior in person. He had not long to wait for the promised revelation. At Mass, his eyes were opened, and he saw the incarnate God in the host. Okay, so here Ignatius has another vision. This is a big moment for him. And he sees Jesus Christ where? In the host. In the mast, okay? I'm sorry, in the mass. So, this is important because in Catholic theology, they have the wafer, right? They do this, um, they believe in this process that the priest actually has power, it's called transubstantiation, to transform the wafer into the literal body and soul of Jesus Christ. And so a lot of times they put up this host, they call it the host, into a device called a monstrance. They lift it up and they actually will bow, bow down to it, pray to it. And here, this ties together with that because he says he saw Christ in the host. What further proof did he need of transubstantiation? Seeing the whole process had been shown to him. Okay, and that's this is important because, as he just said, what further proof did he need? Doesn't need proof from Scripture that transubstantiation is a, is a biblical, you know, is a uh, true doctrine. All he needs is a vision. And that's enough for him. If I see Jesus Christ in the wafer, in the host, then that's enough to prove to me transubstantiation is a true doctrine and that the wafer is changed into Christ. It contains Christ. All he needs is the vision. Um, a short while thereafter, the virgin revealed the virgin revealed herself with equal plainness to his bodily eyes. Okay, so he first, so he has a vision of Jesus Christ, supposedly. Now he has a vision of the Virgin Mary. Not fewer than 30 such visits did Loyola receive. 30 such visits did Ignatius Loyola receive of visions of Christ, visions of the Virgin Mary. He had vision after vision after vision. It's almost like the spirit world was trying to influence this man, had a, had a strong interest in influencing 
this man, Ignatius Loyola, had a purpose for him. It's almost as if Satan himself had a special plan for this man. And he knew the way to get him to go on that path and execute that plan was to give him vision after vision after vision. And so he would be so enraptured and so emotionally attached and invested in these beliefs because of these visions that nothing for the rest of his life would ever change his mind and set him on a different course. That's how powerful these visions are. Okay? So he had... Um, Thirty, no fewer than 30, 30 such visits did Loyola receive. One day as he sat on the steps of the church of St. Dominic at Manresa, singing a hymn to Mary, he suddenly fell into a reverie and had the symbol of the ineffable mystery of the Trinity shown to him under the figure of three keys of a musical instrument. He sobbed for very joy and entering the church, began publishing the miracle. On another occasion, as he walked along the bank of the Lobregat, that waters Manresa, he sat down and fixing his eyes intently on the stream, many divine mysteries became apparent to him, such as other men, says his biographer, Maife, can with great difficulty understand after much reading, long vigils, and study. Okay, so he sits down along uh, this uh, river and he's fixing his eyes on the stream. Now, this is pretty interesting because in the occult, there's a process called uh, scrying. There's a practice called scrying whereby uh, people gaze into a reflective surface like a mirror or a crystal ball or whatever it may be, even water. And when they gaze on this reflective surface, they claim to see, you know, they to be able to practice divination and see the future or the past or some other revelation in the reflective surface. And he's basically doing the same exact thing as this occult practice of scrying in this stream, claiming that all these divine mysteries were revealed to him through gazing at this reflective surface. And so, as you can see, over and over and over again, Ignatius Loyola did not come to his positions and his beliefs and the path in his life from intense study of Scripture. That's not what happened. It came from visions and dreams and scrying through reflective surfaces and seeing Christ in, in a wafer and all these other types of things. None of it had to do with intense study of Scripture. So let's finish this chapter. This narration places us beside the respective springs of Protestantism and Ultramontanism. Because um, the Montanists, you know, did had a lot of things like this that they would practice and visions and dreams and stuff. The source from which the one is seen to issue is the word of God. To it Luther swore fealty and before it he hung up his sword like a true knight when he received ordination. The other is seen to be the product of a clouded yet proud and ambitious imagination and a wayward will. And therewith have corresponded the fruits of as the past three centuries bear witness. Well, now almost five. The one principle has gathered round it a noble host clad in the panoply of purity and truth. In the wake of the other has come the dark army of the Jesuits. Okay, so that's the end of that chapter. That is the origin story of Ignatius Loyola. So as you can see, when you look back on all that, um, you can see a man that was very tortured. 
Um, he tortured himself. But at the end of the day, it's not like responsibility is taken away from him. He still made a choice at the end of the day. Is he, you know, because other people at that time, Protestants, right? Protestant Reformation was thriving at the time. And they were translating the scriptures, turning to the scriptures. He could have found them somehow. Some portions of scripture, whatever it may be. But he didn't want to do that. He wanted to turn to the visions. He And he would read, right? He had no problem reading. He would read the li old lives of these monks and stuff. Uh, hurt himself. To, um, fast until he'd have visions. All these are the types of things. He would turn to anything except Scripture. And so the two things you want to take out of this is, first of all, Ignatius Loyola didn't come to any of the conclusions and um, get on the path that he was on from turning to scripture. And the second point is he had multiple demonic encounters. And I and I absolutely believe these were demonic encounters. All those visions that he had, like the scriptures say, no marvel that Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. That Satan was transforming into these different Catholic vision, you know, things that fit in with the Catholic theology, whether it was Christ and the host, the Virgin Mary, all these other types of things, whatever needed to be done, appearances that he needed to completely bring him into complete bondage to the Catholic Church and the Catholic system so that he would be one of the most dedicated soldiers of the Pope in history and start an army of soldiers for the Pope that be became the most dedicated army of the of the Pope in history army of the Vatican and it all stems back to demonic visions and a rejection of scripture that's how it all started that is a fact of history that's where this all started that was many years ago, almost 500 years ago. That's how it started. And so that pretty much wraps that up. Um, as we'll see as time goes on in future messages, we'll see how um, the order was founded, the first disciples, and then we'll start getting into, you know, a lot of the practices that they were into the techniques that they use, the strategies, and their war against um, the Word of God and the Protestant Reformation. There's a lot, a lot of information to cover, a lot of history, but it's uh, very important. And so I hope this was uh, very informative to you, a blessing to you. Um, and uh, like I said, we're going to continue this series in the future and try to make it through uh, all those different sections in this book and uh, we'll see what other information we can connect to and I like to continue to connect it to a lot of other issues in modern day times as well um, so that's pretty much it thank you for listening and watching please like share subscribe check the links down below and uh, God bless you have a good day